Conic Overlord set the story straight and dropped Gnostic wisdom like a Johnny Appleseed of the Nagamati texts. Here he is, John, my man. Welcome to THC. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. Yeah, John, thanks for being here. It's a real pleasure. And I know we have to kind of start this thing by dedicating just a little time to the Sophia myth, because it really is the only true context for the Archon story, from what I understand. And not many guests give us that context, but I've also heard you say that this story of Sophia is the most suppressed and hidden story in all of mythology, which in our backwards world is usually a good indication that there's more reason to pay attention, wouldn't you say? Well, it sure is. I mean, how many of us today uh, who are trying to keep track of the insanity of the world and the false flag operations and the deceit of the media and the lies and and uh, machinations of the politicians and so forth and so on, ad nauseum, how many of us have come to understand the simple fact that if something is repressed or if you can't talk about it or know about it, it's probably really important for human survival. (laughs) And that certainly applies to the intel of the Gnostics and to the, what I call the Sophianic myth of the mysteries, the pre-Christian pagan mysteries. Historically speaking, the story of the Aeon Sophia, which you can consider as a narrative, call it a narrative or a myth, whichever you like, has been the single most repressed piece of knowledge in all of human history. And we're extremely lucky that we have even been able to recover this piece of knowledge from the mystery schools, this gem of a narrative, because uh, of documents that were discovered in Egypt in 1945 and uh Other materials, very meager materials, as you know, very scant materials in a rather uh, shambolic and disordered uh, condition. But nonetheless, uh, Mm -hmm. if you apply uh, discipline to organize those materials, as I have done, and if you uh, pull together the plot, it turns out that the Material from the Gnostics contains the single and comprehensive description of the origin of humanity and of life on this planet. The single coherent description. Wow. Yeah, and that's really a kind of a shock that's such a big shock, I think, that even though I can say it in plain English... It doesn't necessarily register on people's minds, uh, you know. Right. But that is a fact. It's not a claim I'm making about the Gnostic explanation of how humanity originated and the origin of extraterrestrial or alien intrusion upon our world, uh, the origin of the planet itself, the origin of the three Abrahamic religions and all of this. I'm not just making a claim as if I were to say, well, uh, I like this better than any other, and so I want you to think it's the best explanation around. It is the only complete and coherent explanation of those things that exists. That is a fact. It is an epic narrative, man, and it does tie up so many loose threads. So... Maybe we can dive into the story a little bit. I know you've given plenty of lengthy interviews and breakdowns of the Sophia myth, but maybe we can recount the parts that are important and that we truly need to hear to understand the context of the Archons and understand how life works in this world, because it also explains quite a bit on that front, too. Well, it explains a great deal. But before we go into that, and I would would love to give you, say, the three or four essential outstanding factors of the narrative... Sure. But before we go into that, I I want to make a sort of disclaimer, which is that this narrative is not something that can be spoon-fed to the human mind. So those of you, some of you may be hearing this narrative or hearing about this narrative for the first time. Others who know my work, to a greater or lesser extent, may already know the narrative. There is something 
going in that everyone should recognize and everyone should take a moment, just take a moment to stop and reflect on what I'm going to say now. The Gnostic intel in the Sophianic narrative explaining the origin of life on earth and the purpose of life cannot be received merely as information. You cannot receive it in a merely passive manner. The nature of this information is so powerful, it is like uh, a psychoactive plant influencing your mind. Mm. When you take a psychoactive plant, you must interact with the intelligence of that plant. Isn't that correct? That is true. Right. Well, likewise, the Sophianic narrative is like a living entity. And it is so powerful that if you're going to take it on, if you're going to consider it, you must realize in the first place that you cannot be a passive recipient of this information, that you must become a participant. This is a requirement of the Gnostic intel. You must become a participant who, ev- who evolves and develops this information actively. So I just want to put that out as, a, as, a, as a, an advisory message before uh, you know, we go into the, into the narrative itself. How does that sound? That's perfect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, what could I say to bring to the attention of someone hearing about this for the first time, for instance? What could I say by way of highlighting the four, say, four key factors of the Sophianic myth, the Sophianic vision story, as I call it. Well, it's quite simple to do that because the nature of the human mind is to seek, to seek answers. Mm -hmm. And there may be a lot of people on the planet today, I don't know, how many people are supposed to be here? I think seven. Six and a half billion? Yeah. 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 Okay, that's a lot of people. So there may be, who knows, uh, a large number of those people who, uh, who are not interested in the answers to certain ultimate questions. Mm-hmm. It's possible that they've just lost interest. Right. But those human animals who are still awake and who are functioning as intelligent creatures, intelligent beings, are certainly going to have the craving and the need to ask certain questions. What are these questions? Okay. First of all, where does human life originate? Okay. Mm-hmm. That's a question. How did the planet Earth itself come to exist? That's a question. Uh, are there alien or external uh, extraterrestrial entities who are inimical, inimical to the human species and who attack and prey on the human species? And how did they originate? That's a really big question. <laughs> yes, it is. And finally... Just what is it about the human mind that has brought us to a situation in the world today where many things in our world, in our social order, in our collective life, seem to be going very, very badly wrong? Another way to formulate that question would be to say, perhaps, how did humanity get on such a track towards self-destruction as we see today, right? Well, these are all valid questions. And the Sophianic narrative answers these questions in a coherent and a very lucid manner. And so anyone who is still seeking for answers to those questions, if you're not satisfied with the answers that might come from religion, uh, and you're still looking, would do well to consider what the Gnostics said. So I'll tell you now what they said, okay? Perfect. About these questions and how they answered these questions. First of all, what I call the Sophianic myth is really the story about a goddess. It's a narrative about a central character 
And the character in that myth or narrative is a goddess, not a god. It's a female divine being on the cosmic or galactic level. And her name is Sophia, which means wisdom. We give her a name. We could give her other names, but this is the traditional name that comes to us with the intel. Okay? We call this goddess Sophia, and the story that contains the answers to these ultimate questions is really her biography. Now, that's simple enough, I think. Yes. Yeah, you know, human beings love stories. So this is a story. It's not a made-up story, I must emphasize. It's a story that was constructed through many centuries of careful investigation and teamwork by shamans who were capable of investigating such mysteries. And so it is a story that comes from a source of high authenticity. So what the Gnostics told us, these ancient seers or shamans called the Gnostics, was that in order to understand what we as human animals are doing on this planet, we have to go back to the origin of the human species or the human genome, which they called the anthropos, which is a Greek word. You can translate that word as the seed or genome of the anthropine species. We are the anthropine species. So, how did our species originate? Well, the answer to that big question is that it originated in the core of the galaxy where we are currently located. So, The first thing I guess you could say, tell me what you think of this, but the first thing that people need to do who want to consider the Gnostic creation story, if you will, call it a creation story, is to understand that it is set in our galaxy. The setting is very important. That's true of any story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Think of any novel that you've ever read. Think of any movie you've ever seen. It has to be in a setting, doesn't it? Of course. Right. Well, the beautiful thing I find, or something that I myself find very appealing about the Gnostic myth, is that it tells you precisely what the setting is. The setting is not the universe at large. The setting is not some place beyond time and space where everything miraculously originates. No, the setting is in the galaxy that we are in. We inhabit a galaxy. Human beings living today, myself sitting here talking to you, and all of you out there listening, have one thing in common. We're all inhabiting a planet. That planet belongs to a solar system, that is to say a central star with other planets, and that planetary system is embedded in the arms of a galaxy. This is the cosmic picture. We are, in fact, embedded in the third arm, counting from the center outward, in the third arm of a lenticular spiral galaxy, which has a core or hub, and it has four encircling arms in the form of like a pinwheel. That is the cosmic setting of the Sophianic myth. It does not purport to explain how the galaxies originated, and there are billions of such galaxies as we know today. It simply goes to our galaxy and goes to the core of our galaxy, and that's where the story of Sophia begins. So, technically speaking, this is an astronomical myth. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? That's very clear. And then I guess these beings, that Sophia being one of them, they live in the center of this galaxy, right? That's right. That's right. According to the Gnostic seers who investigated the universe with their minds, who used their intelligence to explore not only the natural world, but the cosmos of the stars and planets, according to them, uh, at the center of our galaxy today, is called the Milky Way Galaxy, 
uh, at the hub, which is about 20, said to be, in scientific terms, about 26,000 light years from where we are. We're out in the limbs, in the third limb, 26,000 light years toward the center of the galaxy. And there, at the hub, is a huge mass of luminosity. Now, what I'm saying here is something that astronomers and astrophysicists themselves would say. So the Gnostic myth is, in many respects, uh, completely compatible with the modern scientific description of our galaxy. Totally compatible. So the galaxy consists of this core or hub and these spiral arms. And it has a lenticular structure. That is to say, if you look at it edge on, it is a bulge in the middle, and then it narrows down to the edges. So it's lentil-shaped. According to the Gnostics, this whole galaxy is alive. But it is alive in two different ways. The way that life appears at the core of the galaxy, which they call the pleroma, P-L-E-R-O-M-A, is different than the way that life appears in the four circling arms. But there is life all through the galaxy. Mm -hmm. What they taught was that beings, actual living self-conscious beings, capable of uh, divine beings, gods and goddesses, if you will, capable of volition, capable of acts of will, capable of, of perception, of seeing, feeling, sensing, just like other living creatures, inhabit the core of the galaxy. So the core of the galaxy, in which there are no stars and no planets, but only a kind of raw, unformed, stellar luminosity, a vast ball of stellar luminosity, it was perceived by them to be the habitat of these beings, and they called them aeons, A-E-O-N-S. So aeon is the Gnostic word for a god. And they discerned that there were male-gendered and female-gendered aeons. And that's not so difficult to understand, because if you think of the aeons, or Gnostic gods, as powerful currents of energy, massive torrents of energy, then you can understand that they would be comparable to positively and negatively charged fields. Right. Or Yeah, right. So that's the, the idea of sexuality or gender among these de- deities is not, is not a big problem. So anyway, according to them, these beings should not be regarded as angelic. Don't picture them as angels with wings. Don't picture them as having any kind of anthropomorphic form. We can ascribe to them feelings, such as human animals have, and thought, as I said, and will, which we consider to be human properties. But they are not to be conceived as human forms. If you need to conceive them or visualize them, the best way to do it is to picture them as vast torrents or serpent-like currents of energy. Hmm, serpent-like. Serpent-like. That's the closest analogy and the most accurate analogy. They are like great sky dragons and great serpents of light that swim and circulate and swim and dance in the core of the galaxy. This is what the myth says. And the story of humanity begins there because the myth says very specifically that these aeons have a way that they pass their time, you see. They live for countless, countless millions and millions of years. As long as the galaxy lives, they are living at the center of the galaxy. That is their habitat. They do not live in the galactic limbs. I'll get to what happens in the galactic limbs in a moment. So they live there, and it is their pleasure and their way uh, to use their time, you might say, to perform experiments. So the way to think of them is, one way to think of them is as scientists 
or kind of like artists and scientists, a combination, who love to perform and create experiments. And one of the ways that they do this is by designing life forms. They design genomic patterns, or what is technically called genomic plasm. And they design these plasms. So if you were to ask a Gnostic, well, where does human life originate? Where does the DNA of the human genome originate? They would say simply, it is designed in the galactic core by aeons for the purposes of conducting an experiment. This is the explanation they give for the origin of our life form and all other life forms in the galaxy, but we're only interested in ours at first because obviously, I think you would agree, if we don't understand our own life form and how and why it is designed, well, there's no point in understanding anything else, is there? <laughs> Agreed. Right. So that's the explanation so far. Uh, to be more specific, they said that the human genome, of which I am an expression, every human animal, every human being who has ever lived, is an expression of the human genome, as we know, the DNA of humanity, is one consistent plasm, or it is one consistent matrix of nucleic acid. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, yeah, nucleic acid. So, uh, this particular genome that came to be manifested as humanity on the earth was designed according to the Gnostics by two aeons, a male aeon called Thelite and a female aeon called Sophia. They gave them these names simply because for the purposes of human intelligence, we need names. We need to name things and define things in order to understand them. They're very limited terms, but nevertheless, they express the truth about the phenomena. Okay? Perfect. Right. So there is an element at this point in the story, I believe, that is really interesting to me, and that's that it seems like this plasm has been doled out to places other than Earth in previous cycles, and uh, apparently it originated near the Orion Nebula, which is interesting because there's authors who've written about the Vatican's interest in the Orion Nebula and all their symbolism and it hidden in their paintings, and so that's kind of a cross-reference that I found really interesting, but uh, I'll let you pick the story up, but I just wanted to make that point about the Orion Nebula playing a role in this tale. Yes, well, it's a good point because it brings us to the logical question which follows now. If the human genomic plasm was actually designed by these divine beings uh, in the galactic core, then how did they deploy it so that it could unfold in an experiment? How did they deploy that plasm? Right. Well, according, right, according to the Gnostic view of our galaxy, there is no animal life or no sentient life, and there, not, there are not even stars or planets at the core of the galaxy, and science would agree on this, because the mass of stellar luminosity at the core of the galaxy is in a constant state of eruption that does not support any structures of life. So if life as we know it is going to appear and emerge in the galaxy, it has to have another environment in which it can appear. Well, that is what the galactic limbs provide. So the, the spiraling arms of the galaxy, which surround it, consist of a heavier kind of matter, unlike the matter at the core of the galaxy, which is pure stellar plasma and stellar luminosity. The matter that is swirling in the external limbs of the galaxy, and this also, by the way, is, 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 uh, you know, high school level astronomy that I'm, that I'm talking here, mm -hmm. consists of other kinds of matter that are heavier matter, uh, elementary particles, and basically what is swirling around in the, in the, uh, uh, galactic arms is Matter as we know it, the constituents of matter as we know it. 
the elements that form material worlds. So material planets can form in the external limbs of the galaxy, but they cannot form at the core. Nevertheless, at the core, the human genome and genomes of other creatures are designed. So the question is, how do you get that designer plasm out of the core and out into the galactic limbs so that it can eventually evolve into creatures who live in the worlds that arise in those limbs. I call the worlds that arise in the galactic limbs planetary laboratories, (laughs) like the Earth. The Earth is a planetary laboratory. A laboratory is a place where an experiment takes place, and the subject of the experiment is a living creature, or many living creatures, but in our case, we want to understand how we ourselves are the subject of the experiment. So the living creature of the Anthropos emerges in planets which exist in the galactic arms. The way that this is done is described quite specifically in the Gnostic cosmological text, where they say that once the aeons have designed a creature, a living plasm, they actually project it into the outer arms of the galaxy, which they do by a kind of method that could be compared to using the device that is used to fertilize an ovum artificially, a pipette, that's the word, okay? A pipette is a really long glass nozzle that has been used to capture a sperm when the sperm is then injected uh, into the ovum in artificial uh, insemination. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. We've all seen that image, right? Right. From right. Uh, you know, right. It's, uh, it's an image magnified, uh, obviously, by a, an electron microscope many, many times. So you can see the living sperm uh, being ejected down the channel of this glass tube and then It is injected into the ovum. They use that kind of method, and what they do is they emanate from the galactic core a kind of stalk of light, which itself is an extension of the plasma of the core. And through that stalk of light, they implant the plasm that has been designed in some place in the galactic limbs. Now, there are many, many places that they could do that. So it follows from the logic of this description that there are many life forms evolving all around in our galaxy. And there are literally millions of planets that support different life forms in our galaxy. So in order to for this process to develop in the way that is of interest to to the aeons, they like to have the experiment be left to its own development. So they don't control the experiment after a certain point. Once the human genome was designed, it was implanted in the third arm of this spiral galaxy in a particular place. And there are places in the spiral arms, locations that are especially favorable to the nesting of these plasms. And these places are called molecular clouds. Go look up what is a molecular cloud. The Orion Nebula is a molecular cloud. Mm. And what scientists now know, and I've, to my knowledge, this has only been a matter of common knowledge to astrophysicists for about maybe 10 years, is that these molecular clouds, such such as you see in the Orion Nebula, M42, are saturated with water. Well, don't you think that a, a cloud of water, a cloud of mist, it's immense, by the way, it's immensely more huge than the solar system, would be an ideal place to deposit this living plasm, because we know that life needs water, correct? That is correct. Yeah. And so according to that scenario, 
the aeons implanted this genome, which had been designed by Thelate and Sophia in the Orion Nebula in the molecular cloud, and then they just let it be. Well, what happens next? Well, the aeons do not control the way that the experiment unfolds. They're really interested in letting the experiments happen according to the conditions provided by the cosmos. And according to those conditions, as we know today, there are filaments of plasm, electrified plasm, that run all through the galactic arms. And these filaments of plasm are able to capture these uh, these plasma filaments, rather, are able to capture these genomes and transplant them through space. This idea, then, is that life on Earth comes from outer space. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. It, but it does not just come from anywhere in outer space. It comes from a molecular cloud in outer space that has itself been seeded from the core of the galaxy. This is the description you get astronomically from the Gnostic materials. And then does it come out kind of like mushroom spores? I would say that mushroom spores are the best example that we have of how this process unfolds. And I find that interesting because there's a lot of psychedelic proponents, uh, people who are fans of the magic mushroom, who talk about its innate intelligence and talk about how, you know, spores are one of the very few things or the only thing that I think modern science can say can survive in a vacuum. So this theory that it's seeded from a mushroom, this has uh, parallels to, to other people's interpretations also. So I find that to be an interesting footnote also. Well, it's more than a footnote. I think it's, it's a piece of intel from the indigenous wisdom of our, uh, of our tribe, of, of humanity, from the indigenous peoples who have used these psychoactive mushrooms uh, and modern-day psychonauts. Uh, it's a piece of intel that's totally complementary with the Gnostic intel. You could say that the Gnostic intel teaches that the human genome, the DNA from which you, human animals develop, uh, pre-exists in spores that are captured in a molecular cloud in Orion. And those spores are subject to drift out of that cloud on plasmic filaments, which are now known to exist and to penetrate the galactic arms. If you go to plasma cosmology or the electric universe people, they talk about this constantly. They talk about these plasma filaments that run between stars and that run through interstellar space. So these plasma Filaments are like currents that can carry these uh, these seeds of life. Uh, Lynn Margulis, who was one of the originators of Gaia theory or the Gaia hypothesis, uh, did not uh, adhere to the Gnostic uh, view of life. I discussed it with her at some length, and she knew about it because she read my book. But in fact, her view of how life originated was identical with what the Gnostics said. She called these spores propagules. And she said that these spores that contain life in a freeze-dried form are able to survive through vast distances of interstellar space, through the vacuum of space, and through very intense cold. And then when they drift down into a planetary atmosphere and settle into a planetary environment that is warm and moist, they burst open and they propagate life. So she called them propagules. So we here speaking today, you and I and everyone who's listening, are here on the planet because propagules floated into the atmosphere of the Earth, were carried toward the atmosphere of the Earth by plasma filaments, and were seeded in the atmosphere of the Earth. That is why there is human life on the planet Earth today. Man, it is such a rich and and dense story, and it makes a lot of sense. But uh, we are almost a quarter of the way through this thing, and we have so much s story left 
Can we, because I have a lot of questions for you about how this relates to the real world today, major religions, our modern geopolitics. So maybe we can bring it up to how the earth was formed and the archons kind of come out of that same event, right? Sure. If you give us, I'm looking at the clock, if you give us 15 more minutes on the mythological background, then we can fast forward to those other subjects. That is perfect, John. Okay. So. Now we come to the question of, well, does that mean that other strains of this human anthropos, plasm, have seeded on other planets in this galaxy? Well, absolutely, yes. And currently, right now, as I speak, there are probably other uh, strains of the same human genome living on other Earth-like planets here and there around the galaxy. Most certainly, highly, highly probable. You know, one of the discoveries of science in the last 10 years that has been most, uh, let's say, uh, that has gotten a lot of attention is the existence of many Earth-like planets. Isn't that true? It is. Right. So there are other Earth-like planets. There are other planetary laboratories in which other strains of humanity are evolving, completely independent of us. And the aeons in the galactic center using their divine powers of observation, are observing these experiments and watching how they develop. They're not interfering with them. They don't have a beginning, a middle, and an end plan for these experiments because they like to leave the experiments open-ended. You could say that the divine gods of the galaxy respect the freedom of the experiment, and it may crash, it may go bad, or it may develop in a beautiful and harmonious way. This is what makes it interesting. But now we come to a really peculiar point about Gnostic cosmology. It's not correct to say that the Earth is just another planet which happened to arise in the galactic arms due to the perpetual conditions of the materialization and dematerialization of stars and planets. It's not correct to say that. The Gnost- because the Gnostics said, and this is probably the most famous line, you can quote from the Gnostic materials. It's from the Gospel of Philip. And it's one single line, and it says, The world system you inhabit came about due to an anomaly. Now, some scholars translate as that last word as a mistake. The world system that you, human beings, inhabit came about due to a mistake, due to an, an anomaly or something that was not predicted to happen. And the actual Greek word in the text is anomou, A-N-A-M-O-U. So I prefer the word anomaly to mistake, because mistake sort of has a judgment attached to it. It wasn't a mistake, but the planet Earth arose in a very bizarre manner. Normally planets arise, as I say, by a natural process of accretion of matter in the galactic limbs. And even science will explain this to you if you want to go investigate. But the Gnostic myth says that the origin of the planet Earth was special. It was an anomaly. And the anomaly was due to the fact that the Aeon Sophia, remember she was the one of the designers of the human genome, became so fascinated with how this species would develop. She became so identified with it, identified with her creation, and with its evolution, that she did something that aeons do not normally do. She left the galactic core. She plunged from the galactic core, and she passed out into the region of the galactic arms. And she became involved in the laws of materialization, gravity, electromagnetism, and so forth, that work in the galactic arms. And as a result of her fall, this is called the fall of Sophia, or the fall of the wisdom goddess, she herself, the galactic divinity of the core, turned into the planet Earth. So what the Gnostics teach us is that we are living on a planet which is a habitat of nature, consisting of oceans, mountains, the sky, rivers, the material body of the Earth, and all of that is actually the materialization of a divinity or goddess 
from the galactic core. Mm -hmm. So that very goddess who designed us is present right now in this planet, is present to us. We can reach her. We can contact her. We can know that she is present, and we can communicate and interact with her. And this is an extraordinary situation. You must try to get your mind around the huge proposition that there are many other planetary laboratories in which this is not the case. So the world system that we inhabit came about due to an anomaly. So that is the Gnostic explanation of the creation of the earth. The creation of humanity, the creation of the earth. Now, finally, to round off the cosmological background, we come to the even more bizarre phenomenon, which is called in Gnostic teachings, the generation of the archons. Now, as you probably know, uh, but others listening may not know, I introduced the word archons into the discourse on this planet about uh, 12 years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been taken up by many, many people. And I'd like to say that it's extremely important to me, as the person who introduced it, that people recognize two things. First of all, when I introduced it, I spoke of it in the way that Gnostics taught. I didn't speculate. I didn't make up my own ideas about ETs. I didn't use the Sitchin hypothesis. I didn't talk about ETs uh, engineering the human genome. That is not true. ETs did not engineer the human genome. The aeons at the core of the galaxy are our true cosmic parents. What I did was I followed the Gnostic intel and I reported on the aeon, on the archons according to the Gnostic intel. And the second thing that I did, which unfortunately many people disregard, is that I stressed that the Gnostics taught that the archons or extraterrestrial parasites that prey upon humanity came about as a result of Sophia's action, that she accidentally produced these archons. And I can't think of anyone who uses the word archon today who includes that important piece of information, which is very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Right. You need that whole context to really understand what the archons are, how they came to being. And there's also an element in terms of our solar system's composition where uh, that involves the archons. Maybe you could discuss that a little bit. Sure. Let's make that the last piece of the cosmological picture that we're setting here, which is the framework for the rest of our discussion, okay? Perfect. Again, you really need to use your imagination. You need to, to think logically. You, you, to take in this story, this is a complex scenario. This is not a simple myth. This is a complex myth. But the beauty of it, once you get into it, I think is, is just indisputable. The beauty and the coherence of it are, are tremendous. And once you get the picture operating in your mind uh, and you can see it, you realize that there are many things that we are told by science that verify it. So it is a verifiable myth. It is not something to be taken on faith. What the Gnostics said was that when that you should, uh, I, I say that you should envision the fall of Sophia as a massive spike of pure stellar plasma from the galactic core. As a matter of fact, about 15 years ago, astrophysicists discovered the traces of such a spike. They discovered that there is a trail or path leading directly, a tunnel leading directly from the core of our galaxy to the area of the third arm where the solar system is located. So they, in fact, found the evidence the smoking gun of what the Gnostics said about Sophia's plunge. There was a massive discharge of plasma from the galactic core. This is an anomaly. It doesn't happen all the time. And at the end of that discharge, at the, at the very end of it, where it terminated, eventually the planet Earth arose as the materialization of the body of the goddess. 
but there was a secondary effect of that event. Because it is not normally the case for the plasma of the galactic core to discharge into the galactic arms, the discharge, fall of Sophia in mythological terms, created an extraordinary impact in the area of material and elementary substance of the third galactic arm. You could imagine it in this way. Imagine uh, a stream of foam like you have in a fire extinguisher. Imagine a stream of foam being shot out of a high tension hose. And imagine that this stream of foam was shot out straight down, say, into uh, a flat area that consisted of sand. Well, that stream of foam would obviously cause an enormous disturbance in the sand. And as the foam dried and crystallized, it would take up parts, particles of the sand in it, and it would form that sand into erratic patterns that the sand would not otherwise take had it not been subjected to this, uh, this torrent of foam. That's one of the analogies you could use to picture this event. And so the first thing that happened as a result of the plasmic discharge from the galactic core was that it produced this bizarre species. It produced these insect-like cyborgs called archons. Now, if you want to go and understand this phenomenon, you have to go investigate what is called the Akari insects, A-C-A-R-I, or specifically the abiogenesis of the Akari insects. This is an experiment that was done around 1830 by a man named Andrew Cross, and in this experiment, which is widely documented in scientific literature, you can find it on the Internet, Andrew Cross, C-R-O-S-S-E, Akari Insects, he produced tiny insects like mites by the generation of an electromagnetic field. Wow. This is a fact. And I didn't know this fact when I first reconstructed the Gnostic myth and when I told the story that I just described of the generation of the archons. And I remember very clearly when I was putting that together for not in his image, I thought, oh, shit, you know, this is the part <laughs> of the mythology that people aren't going to buy, you know. Nobody's going to buy right. the, the, you know, the statement that insect-like creatures, which is what the archons are, they're inorganic cyborgs, could spontaneously appear in outer space because of the mysterious impact of some plasmic discharge. And then, <laughs> but I wrote it anyway because I, I, had, I trusted the Gnostic material and then some years later, well, sure enough, I got confirmation that this is possible in this, in this amazing phenomenon. So, Ano yeah. Well, I just wanted to say another re a reason I think that is so fascinating is because we've been talking a little bit about spider beans lately and how at Bohemian Grove, uh, in front of the gate, it says, weaving spiders come not here. And in this context, it starts to make me think of like secret electromagnetic sciences. Maybe they spawn some type of spider-like creatures. Maybe that's a direct cryptic uh, message to archons to not come there. Um, it's very odd, but that phrase, weaving spiders coming out here, is starting to make a little more sense as more things unravel. Yeah, it's a mysterious phrase, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. But anyway, to cut to the chase and to conclude this background right. part of our, our discussion, it's important to know that the people who provided us today with the intel on the archons and they profiled their behavior – Brilliantly, they described how they abduct souls by night, which you would call ET abductions. Right. They described their appearance as being of a neonate form, that is to say, uh, a prematurely born fetus with a large head and big eyes and spindly limbs. All of this they described. Well, have some respect, folks, because the people who gave you that intel on the archons 
also told you where the archons originated. So don't ignore that part of the intel. They originated in the solar system before the earth was created, before Sophia herself turned into the earth. And they were given the task by Sophia and given the uh, power to organize material and elementary substance into their own habitat. So they created the solar system independent of the earth, sun, and moon. And that solar system that they created that belongs to the archons is the inorganic part of our solar system. That is to say, the inorganic planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are productions of the archons, and they are the habitat of the archons. The archons primarily live, as far as I can tell, in the rings and moons of Saturn. Hmm. But they are able to travel through the solar system, and they are able to impinge upon the Earth, although they cannot invade the Earth, because they cannot live on the planet Earth, because oxygen is toxic to them, and they are an inorganic species that mainly attacks humanity through telepathic means and through implanting deviant ideas in the human mind. So this is the Gnostic message about the Archons, that were created accidentally by our own planetary mother, Sophia. Yeah, I know that there's so much more depth to it, but I really do appreciate that background context. And um, So how do we bridge this story, the creation of the Earth and humanity? How do we bridge that with the things going down in ancient Babylon, You know, the creation of the first three major religions, basically this round of recorded history for us? Right. Well, I find that the way to get your mind, one way to get your mind, the best way, I would say, to get your mind around the whole picture, bringing us down to the situation today, is to use a metaphor, and that is the divine experiment. So let's say that humanity on Earth, humanity on this planet, is the expression of a divine experiment. What is the experiment? Well, the experiment is simply the process by which humanity would unfold the skills and talents that were given to it by its designers. You know, So we were designed with certain capacities, mental capacities uh, to calculate, uh, to measure, uh, to develop symbolic codes, to speak many languages. Uh, we have the talents, aesthetic talents, musical talents. We have talents for social organization. These talents distinguish human animals from other animals on the planet. And as the subject of the divine experiment, we are here to see how we can develop and unfold these talents in a way that is beautiful and harmonious with the cosmic order. That is the purpose of the experiment. But obviously there is something wrong with the experiment because human beings are extremely destructive toward each other, toward their environment. And so the question is, what has gone wrong with the divine experiment that was originally intended by those aeons, those gods and goddesses of the galactic center? Well, there are two answers to the question of what has gone wrong. Part of what has gone wrong comes from the archons and their meddling with the experiment. You see, according to the Gnostic cosmology, which we just went through in 45 minutes, that wasn't too bad, was it? No, not at all. Uh, according to them, I can make a statement to you, which I believe will eventually be confirmed by science. And, is, and science is, in fact, on the verge of confirming this statement. The Gnostics claimed that the planet Earth was formed anomalously, as I said, and that it does not properly belong to the solar system. They claimed that the planet Earth is a living entity, a living superorganism, captured in an inorganic system. The Earth is captured in the solar system. And the solar system at large is an inorganic system. It consists of inorganic planets, which are 
the habitat of the archons. Hmm. So this, this is a remarkable statement. But this presents a problem because the archons are not, they are very intrusive. It is said in one of the cosmological texts, I think it's called The Reality of the Archons, is the title of it, that they do not observe the boundaries of the place where they were put. So if they had observed their boundaries, they would simply inhabit the solar system. They would be creatures living out there. They might occasionally, uh, you know, be detec- detected by human beings with paranormal faculties, but they wouldn't meddle with us. But the point is that they meddle and they mess and intrude with the human experiment. And they do that primarily through entering our minds and through putting a foreign implants in our minds. So if you want to understand the role of the archons and the way that they cause problems for humanity, you have to be able to take on board the concept of what Carlos Castaneda called a foreign installation. Hmm. There is a foreign installation in the human mind due to the archons. Now, one thing I think is interesting, I just wanted to mention about your talking about the Sophia becoming the Earth right. and being in an inorganic solar system, there's also an emphasis on the idea of the sun, moon, earth system, that that is like a three-part system, almost like clockwork. And I think that's really interesting because when we talk about the elite, they obviously have a synchronization to their events, their false flags, they have codes in their dates. And a lot of people lately have been speculating here about why our calendar was reset at year one, and I'm just curious if maybe this is an Archon plan to kind of get us out of sync with what could be an amazing experience if we took the clues from the sun and the equinox as markers for how we should be acting or when we should be acting. Well, yeah, the natural, the opportunity for the human animal living on the planet is to synchronize itself with the life rhythms that support our life here, the living rhythms, the organic rhythms, which are called biorhythms. Now, it's known, and this is not speculation, that the biorhythms are of three kinds. There is the telluric biorhythms associated with the motion of the Earth, like the daily rotation of the Earth. There are the lunar biorhythms, the 28-day cycle of the moon, and the four phases of the moon. And there are the solar biorhythms, which are the four seasons of the year and the larger rhythms such as sunspot cycles and so on. If we were to observe these rhythms, feel them, respond to them, and organize our society according to them, then we would live harmoniously in the three-body system. We are intended by the design of Sophia to live in a three-body system. Hmm. We could live, for instance, in a planetary system that consisted only of a star, the sun, a satellite to the earth, the moon, and the earth. That is how we were divinely designed to live. But that three-body system is captured in the inorganic system of the archons. So we have two systems operating at once on us. And the tendency of the evil-minded people of the planet is to use the archontic mindset to take us away from the natural system and put us in an artificial system, the matrix. Mm -hmm. So when the Illuminati use these dates and these codes... They are not really operating or carrying out their nefarious and evil plans uh, according to the natural rhythms, but they are doing so according to an archontic system of mind control. That archonic system of mind control, which is called predictive programming and other things like that, you know what I'm talking about, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. revelation of the method. Yeah, that would not even work upon us if we lived in constant interaction with the solar, lunar, and terrestrial cycles. Now, of course, many indigenous people did so live in that way, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Before we, yeah, before we entered the Industrial Age, and even well into the Industrial Age, indigenous peoples 
such as the Inuit, used to be called Eskimos, the Inuit of Iceland, or the Aborigines of Australia, or the natives of South America, or the, or the, the Native Americans of, of North America, uh, you name them, they all lived in close and intimate harmony with those three biorhythms. Now, it's no accident that in order for the archontic uh, powers and those who serve the archonic powers uh, to prevail in this world, they have to destroy all indigenous people, and they've done a pretty good job of it. Mm-hmm. There's very few left. Right, right. You say, why, why do they target indigenous people? Why do they target pagans who live in harmony with the earth? Because that is the greatest threat to them. Because if your connection to the earth and the life cycles of the earth is strong enough, you cannot be deviated or influenced by the archons or their human counterparts. Wow. So like the institution of the Gregorian calendar or getting people in the nine to five, five day work week, all those things you could say are them putting energy into disrupting our natural rhythm or keeping us from getting in that harmonious synchronization, maybe? Yeah, we are designed to live in symbiosis. That is our design. We are designed to live. Symbiosis means sim means uh, in unity, and biosis means life. We are designed to live in unity with the larger patterns of life around us. The whole uh, direction of the archontic takeover of the human mind is toward a matrix. They really are the the creators of the matrix, which is a mind control system that is artificially constructed. And they began uh, one of the tools of that mind control is the calendar, Mm -hmm. you know, to live according to the calendar uh, of the civic calendar. You work on these days, you have holidays on these days. That whole uh, system of calendrical order is a terrible weapon against the natural way of life on this planet. Wow, that is deep. I like like hearing about that. In fact, patriarchy uh, used uh, the calendar from the beginning uh, in order to take people out of nature. It's a, it's a long story. Several people have dedicated their lives to, to studying that, that event. So let's see what are your questions and concerns about bringing this Gnostic intel into relevance uh, in the world today. Well, I've heard you describe the Lord Archon, or I assume one of the higher Archons, as Jehovah. And also there's the saga, I guess this starts with the Zadokim. Right. Now, did... Did Jehovah make contact with the Zadokim? Is that how you would describe that? Right. It appears that uh, the Gnostics warned us about something that happened not too long ago. I think you could say it happened maybe around uh, the time of the historical uh, Abraham, the patriarch Abraham. If you consider him to have been an historical entity, then you would place him around uh, 1800 B.C., okay? Perfect. Right. At that time, the Archons uh, achieved a great breakthrough into the human mind. Now, I want to warn people that I know there are many people out there who have read the works of Zachariah Sitchin and more recent followers of the Sitchin story, such as Michael Tellinger and so forth, and a great many other people probably including David Icke and others, who claim that these archons uh, cracked into the human genome and they hijacked, in some manner, the human genome. According to the Gnostic intel, they did not succeed in cracking into the human genome, but they did achieve a neural hack. Can you see the difference? Absolutely. Right. They didn't biologically crack into the genome because, remember, who designed the genome? The genome was divinely designed in the galactic core by these cosmic artists and scientists, and they sealed the genome very, very carefully against intrusion. However, around 1800 BC, it appears that the overlord, the archons, may be considered as a hive species. And Most of them are drones, 
The drones are the uh, Whitley Schreiber gray alien type, which is called a neonate because it resembles a prematurely born fetus. But there are Archon overlords, or in particular, one master of the hive, which is described as Dracona, D-R-A-K-O-N-A, in the Greek Coptic text. That is to say, as a draconic or reptilian form. So there is a reptilian overlord, and then there are the Archon drones. This is how you you visualize them, Mm. based on the Gnostic intel. They gave us this intel 1,600 years ago, and it had all, and they had already been developing this intel for many, many millennia. So they had the scoop on the archons and on ETs before anyone else on the planet. So I say respect them for what they knew and, you know, follow their material consistently. This is what they said. They said that uh, they warned us. This warning, however, is not contained in the surviving Gnostic materials, but it's contained in the arguments of the church fathers against the Gnostics. Uh, but it is written very explicitly in uh, the works of Irenaeus called uh, Against Heresies. In that book, in that uh, volume, book one, chapter four, he says that the Lord Archon which the Gnostics called Eldabayot, strange word, managed to get access to the mind of a certain part of the human species, the ancient Hebrews, and that they infected the mind of the Hebrews with an alien virus or an alien mindset, and that they chose the Hebrews to be their representatives, and therefore to wage war upon the rest of the human species by using the ancient Hebrews as their instruments of intrusion into our species. And the way that they did that, the Gnostics warned us about this. This is quite explicit. The way that they did that is that they installed an implant in the brain. They made a neural hack into the brain's of that particular tribe of people. And as a result of that hack, there arose within the ancient Hebrews, at the time of Abraham, a cult, a sect. It didn't involve all of the people of the Hebrew or Jewish racial lineage, but a certain fraction of them formed a cult, and they were called the Zadikim. That comes from the Hebrew letter Zadik, or Tzadik, which is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And the word Zadik means the righteous, or the superior, or the supreme. So, this cult, historically speaking, arose around 1800 BC, and this cult is the germ of Salvationist and Messianic religion. And it developed first in Judaism, then it spread into Christianity, then it spread into Islam. So all three of the Abrahamic religions derive from the same source. And that source is an extraterrestrial implant in the human mind. Now this sounds kind of like a science fiction scenario, and yet it is an exact paraphrase of what the Gnostics taught. Mm -hmm. So the experiment... With the Anthropos, let's say, I'll put it in another another way, our ability as human animals to just live in peace together on this planet, to coexist with each other, and to investigate the natural world, and to discover and unfold our true potential as creations of Sophia, is interfered with. We are not allowed to do it because there is a foreign influence working among us. And that foreign influence takes the form of religion, of a religious ideology, of salvation, the chosen people, the Messiah, 
and the end of the world scenario. Those ideas, which are widespread in human culture, as you know, do not even belong in the human mind. They are not a product of human mentality, even though they have been received and developed and transmitted by the human mind. They do not originate in the human mind. They originate as an alien transplant in our minds, an alien virus. Mm -hmm. This is what the Gnostics taught. Yeah, I find this part fascinating because I I just think that the three major religions, of course, are are responsible for more death and division than anything on the planet. And I just think this kind of thing makes so much sense. And when you look at the top of these religions, they're all dealing with pedophilia. They all have uh, insane wealth when they say they care about the people, but they clearly don't. And it's like this archonic manifestation that is the Abrahamic religions. It's like this virus got like a software program that had a few major updates. And that's right. The way I've heard you describe it is first, of course, we have these Hebrews and they've been manipulated into thinking they're a chosen people, which separates them from the rest of humanity. That, that was like a closed group. So it didn't spread very, very far because they're not out there trying to make converts. They have a specific number. They don't evangelize. Right. They don't evangelize. That's right. exactly. But then through St. Paul, and I described this specifically how this happened in the first six chapters of my book, not in his image. Through St. Paul, the archonic virus that had been incubating in the ancient Hebrews in the Zadokim sect went pandemic in Christianity. So it mutated, it rebooted itself in a pandemic form in Christianity, and then it rebooted itself again in an even more vicious form, in Islam. So all three of those religions are expressions of this virus. There is actually an alien virus infecting the human brain on this planet, and that is why the insanity of religion has been spread across the pages of history. As you said, and, and it's, it's obvious when you say it, these three religions have produced more destruction, more murder, more division and violence than anything else in the world. Right. And that is because they do not belong in this world. They do not belong here. You know, one of the most difficult things, I think perhaps the most difficult block that people face in getting the benefit of this Gnostic material, which, by the way, is tremendously liberating, is that we are used to thinking that those religions and the concepts in those religions, you know, the concept of the chosen people, of the Messiah, of God's plan by which humanity will be tested and then rewarded or punished, you know, we are so accustomed to those notions that we think, we assume that human beings produce them and they must be the product of our own minds. Mm-hmm. But they're not. Right. And, and when, when, when you begin to consider that they're not the product of our own minds, that is an incredible awakening. <laughs> it is. It's been a really fascinating time, John. I know a, a lot of researchers are kind of given, using these terms and using the cliff notes to this worldview, but you never really get the details from them. So I think it's fascinating that you've done that for us. It's really nice to hear. Glad we could do this. Do you want to remind people about your website and books or anything else you got going on yourself before I let you go? No, they can just go look at metahistory.org. Metahistory.org. Okay, perfect. Metahistory.org. Very cool. Well, thanks again. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. There we have it, Ironside Chatters. Wow.